Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just a few things here at the top, and then we'll get right to your questions. Um, up front, I want to just express again our condolences to the family members and loved ones of the three U.S. soldiers who were killed in Jordan this weekend in the Iran proxy drone attack at Tower 22. Our thoughts and prayers continue to be with them. Secretary Austin will be calling each of the families to personally relay his respects and is planning to attend the dignified transfer of remains at Dover Air Force Base on Friday as well. Of note, the U.S. Army Reserve announced earlier today that Specialist Kennedy Sanders and Specialist Breonna Moffitt have been posthumously promoted to the rank of sergeant. We're also keeping our service members who were wounded in our thoughts and wish them all a speedy recovery. In terms of updates, at this time, we're currently tracking more than 40 U.S. service members with reported injuries ranging from lacerations to possible concuss concussions pending TBI assessments. As previously briefed, eight personnel were medically evacuated out of Jordan for follow-on care. Three of those eight were transported to Launch Dual Regional Medical Center in Germany, one of whom is reported to be in critical but stable condition. The other two service members are in fair and stable condition. After further examination by the Launch Dual Trauma Team, a determination will be made by medical staff whether any of these injured service members will require transfer back to the U.S. for further treatment. In terms of additional details about the drone attack itself, we know there are still many questions to include how the one-way attack drone could have penetrated the facility's air defenses, its point of origin, and which specific Iranian proxy group is responsible. I can tell you that U.S. Central Command is continuing to look into all those important questions and that we'll keep you updated as new information becomes available as we are able to. What we do know is that Iran-backed militias are responsible for these continued attacks on U.S. forces and that we will respond at a time and manner of our choosing. While we do not seek to escalate tensions in the region, we will also take all necessary actions to protect our troops, our facilities, and our interests. Shifting gears, yesterday the U.S. Ambassador to the Czech Republic, Bijan Sabe, and Czech Defense Minister Jana Chernikova signed a contract for the purchase of 24 F-35 fighter aircraft. The acquisition of these F-35s will increase the combat capability of the Czech military and strengthen NATO and the bilateral security of Czechia and the United States. With the signing, the Czech Republic joins 18 countries, including 10 in Europe, that employ the F-35. Uh, as you know, all foreign military sales are coordinated through the U.S. State Department, so I would refer you to my colleagues at State for more information. And finally, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Western Hemisphere Affairs Dr. Daniel Erickson hosted the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Keith Rowley, at the Pentagon yesterday. Performing the duties of Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Ms. Melissa Dalton also joined the meeting to emphasize the Department's strong support of the U.S. defense partnership with Trinidad and Tobago. DOD leaders expressed appreciation for Trinidad and Tobago's leadership in the Caribbean community and in co-hosting the upcoming Caribbean Nations Security Conference alongside U.S. Southern Command in November of 2024. They further commended the robust partnership between the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force and the Delaware National Guard, which celebrates its 20th anniversary this year through the State Partnership Program. The senior officials exchanged views on illicit trafficking, maritime security, defense force modernization and training, cybersecurity and frameworks to facilitate expanded bilateral security cooperation. The meeting also reaffirmed the U.S. and DOD's commitment to partnership with Trinidad and Tobago and to working together to improve Caribbean regional security and resilience. With that, I'd be happy to take your questions. We'll go to AP Tarkov. Thanks, General Ryder. Um, has Secretary Austin provided the President response options at this point? Or is the building still looking at the best way to deter future strikes? And I have a few couple others. Yeah, thanks, Tara. Um, so I'm not going to get into the specific conversations that the Secretary has had with the President. Uh, as I've highlighted, uh, we will respond in a time and manner of our choosing. Is the building still evaluating options on how best to respond at this point? Uh, I'm not going to get into the specifics as it relates to potential future operations, other than, again, to reiterate that we will respond in a time and manner of our choosing. Well then, General. let's take it another way. Um, you said from the podium the U.S. does not seek to widen this war, but how do you deter Iran, which has clearly supplied and endorsed some of these attacks from uh, keeping from doing this again and leading to another proxy attack on U.S. forces? Yeah, so again, as a reminder, uh, our forces are in uh, Iraq and Syria uh, and in the region 
supporting the uh, lasting defeat of ISIS. That's the mission that we've been focused on. Um, when we need to, we will protect our forces. Again, I'm not going to get into uh, telegraphing or discussing potential future operations other than to say, again, uh, we will respond in a time and manner of our choosing. Jennifer. General Ryder, have you attributed to Kateb Hezbollah or any other group who is responsible for this drone strike? So, Jennifer, uh, Central Command is still assessing, um, but again, we are confident uh, that these, this uh, attack was uh, sponsored by Iranian-backed proxies. So, Kateb Hezbollah has just put out a um, message on Telegram suggesting that telling its fighters not to attack U.S. Uh, bases in Iraq and Syria suggesting that they will support uh, the fight in Gaza in other ways and suggesting that even if the U.S. strikes them not to respond. What is your response to that? Yeah, we've, we've seen those reports. I don't have a specific comment to provide other than actions speak louder than words. Thanks. Laura. Thank you. A couple questions. First of all, can you speak a little bit about the drones that are based at Tower 22 in Altanth? We saw some, we had some reporting yesterday that the, there was some confusion over whether the drone coming into the base was uh, friendly or was friend or foe. And I know that these, most of these drones should have IFF software enabling them to distinguish between the two. So I'm just wondering if you could tell me whether those drones do have that software. Yeah, thanks, Laura. So, so no, I'm not going to get into the specifics on the kind of uh, capabilities as it relates to intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance capabilities that we have. Um, in terms of the uh, the reasons behind how uh, this one-way attack drone was able to penetrate uh, the facility's air defenses, that's something that Central Command is looking at now. Um, and I'm just not going to get in be able to get into the specifics of that. The second question then, actually on a different topic, there was a, another report today saying that um, the U.S. is open to reopening discussions with Turkey to let them buy F-35s. I was wondering if you can speak on that from the DOD's perspective. Are you aware of those discussions? Um, I, I've seen uh, the, the comments by our State Department uh, colleagues on that. I'd refer you to State to discuss, as you know, um, right now with Turkey maintaining the S-400. Uh, that is currently not something that, that is um, on the table, but I'd refer you to state. Let me go to Missy. Um, just a couple questions, Pat. Thank you. Um, is there any update on whether Secretary Austin will come and talk to us um, sometime soon? First question. Uh, again, I don't, I don't have a date to announce. Certainly aware of the request, and we'll keep you updated. Okay. And um, on Jordan, can you just clarify, Is are the troops in Jordan at Tower 22 and other bases, are they under OIR authority or are they there under some other authority? Can you specify that? Um, and is it right that there are about 3,000 troops in Jordan? Um, Missy, I'll have to come back to you on the total number of U.S. forces deployed to Jordan, so we'll, we'll take that question. Um, the forces uh, that were, um, you know, the, the three soldiers that were killed, uh, again, as we've highlighted, they were there in support of Operation Inherent Resolve. Uh, supporting the defeat ISIS so that mission. That means that they're under OIR authority at Tower 22? Uh, operating uh, in support of OIR. Okay. So does that mean they report to the commander of OIR? It, it, it's, I mean, I don't want to get into the chain of command yeah. process here, but if they're there supporting OIR, then certainly OIR commander can request assistance from those forces. Okay. So. And then the last question, um, and I think we asked Sabrina this yesterday, and I, I think it was maybe something that you guys were still looking at. Just wanted to ask if there had been any um, new information about any steps that may be taken to protect um, American forces in the region, like in terms of air defense or new steps to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. Yeah. So, you know, for operation security reasons, I'm not going to be able to go into specifics other than to say that U.S. Central Command, of course, is taking this very seriously uh, and that we will take necessary measures and steps to ensure that our forces are protected, uh, recognizing as well that, that this is a dangerous neighborhood. Um, but again, yes, to answer your question, uh, we will take steps to ensure that our forces are protected. We go to Will. Uh, two questions. Um, first, uh, Qatar's Prime Minister expressed some concerns yesterday that um, the U.S. response to the Jordan attack could potentially affect the uh, negotiations over a new hostage deal. Is, is that part of the Pentagon's calculus in, in, in determining a U.S. response to this? 
So, well, I don't have anything specifically on that other than to say, again, you know, as part of any decision making process, we take a wide range of considerations into account, again, to include what our broader regional goals uh, are, which from the very beginning has been to prevent uh, the situation in Israel uh, and Gaza from, uh, you know, expanding into a broader conflict. I'll just leave it there. Second. Um it's been it's been two days since the the, the attack in Jordan. Um, is there concern that that this the, that delay in in, a res, in responding could give these groups um, time to prepare um, to uh, to you know disperse from likely targets, etc.? So, well, what I you know again, I'm not going to get into any details of what, about what uh, a potential future operation could look like. You've heard both the president and Secretary Austin say that we will respond in a time and a manner of our choosing. Three U.S. service members were killed, over 40 wounded. Oh, by the way, these service members were deployed into the region to contribute to regional security and stability in support of the international coalition to ensure the lasting defeat of ISIS. So there will be consequences, and I'll just leave it at that. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Just a quick question on the Red Sea. Since the Houthis are mainly attacking like foreign ships, what, um, what authorization does the Pentagon have to strike targets in Yemen? Uh, again, uh, in terms of the uh, strikes, these are all being taken under uh, United Nations uh, Section 51 in terms of right to self-defense. Uh, and, you know, again, our focus there is, is twofold. One, it's to protect international shipping and mariners that are transiting the Red Sea, uh, as well as to degrade and disrupt Houthi capability to conduct these kinds of attacks. Fadi. I just have a follow-up on, on this, and then I have a separate topic. The Section 51 that you mentioned, I mean, before strikes on Yemen, Yemenis did not attack any U.S. ship. So what self-defense are you talking about? Defending international commerce is not part of the international law. Well, what, so what are you is, suggesting? What are you suggesting? Huh? What, what are you suggesting? I'm suggesting that when you refer to this section from the U.N., you're saying U.S. was attacked by Houthis. Before the first strike, I'm saying that the international Yemen. community has been attacked by Houthis, and the U.S. working alongside international allies and partners are working together to help deter, degrade, and disrupt their ability to conduct these attacks. You reference something in the U.N. that does not apply to this situation prior to the January first wave of attacks in Yemen. Fadi, I think that international mariners uh, have the ability or have the right to be defended transiting international waterways. Um, so happy to engage with the offline, um, but. No, but by their countries, not, I mean, okay. Okay. Uh, but Tom. my question, can I ask a different topic? I'll, I'll come back to you, Tom. Okay. Uh, thanks, General. Um, just going back to Kateh Hezbollah, um, you have a pro-Iranian militia saying they're gonna pause the attacks on the US forces, and then you say actions speak louder than words. I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that might change the calculus in the building. Um, would you be concerned that if you do strike, um, KH or any other groups, then you are escalating uh, in the face of them saying they're standing down, given that you've said repeated, oh, the administration has said that you do not seek to escalate. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, I'm just not going to get into hypotheticals, um, and I'm going to refrain from editorializing on uh, those kinds of comments after 160 plus attacks against U.S. forces. Sir. So, but the same question, following on Tom's question, do you welcome the Qatar Hezbollah statement for suspicion of their attacks on your forces in Iraq, Syria? Do you welcome yeah, again, I've already provided a comment on right. that. So okay. yesterday, the Pentagon officials met with the Peshmerga forces in Iraqi Kurdistan, and the committee reviewed the progress made towards Peshmerga reform. Could you speak of the nature of your cooperation with the Peshmerga forces, and how do you assess the reforms in the Peshmerga ministry? Yeah, well, as you know, I mean, we have a long-standing relationship um, going back many years uh, with the Peshmerga uh, as, as it pertains to its association with the Iraqi security forces. And so the statement that we posted yesterday, I think, lays out what, what efforts are being made to further bolster and strengthen that relationship within the auspices of the government of Iraq. Uh, and the Iraqi security forces, uh, and so we'll continue to to uh, use that opportunity to help ensure that uh, our uh, Peshmerga partners have the capabilities they need to support broader uh, Iraqi security and stability, 
and you know when we have updates we'll certainly pass that along let me go to the phone here real quick eric schmidt new york times uh pat can you give us a little bit of chronology on sunday morning what time did this attack the drone attack take place how quickly were uh, the most seriously injured uh where they be uh, where they medevaced to iraq and um and, and then just kind of looking ahead in terms of any additional air defenses that you may be uh, moving to the region or realigning the region uh, to do this, to, to help protect forces in, in place there. Yeah, thanks, Eric. On the, on the last question again, um, you know, if we have details to provide on the specific types of air defense systems that we uh, would be moving into the the area i don't have anything to announce right now other than to say again central command is going to take and is taking necessary steps to ensure that our forces are protected uh, as far as timelines um, i will take that question and we'll come back to you uh, again this this attack happened uh, saturday night our time uh, sunday morning uh, iraq time uh, and again we'll we'll come back to you with what we're able to provide on that Fadi. Thank you, um, I want to go back to the KH uh, statement. It's it's really unusual, and some of the um, messages in this statement refer to uh, suspension of these attacks. They don't want to uh, basically embarrass the Sudanese government. At the same time, uh, they're saying Iran was not always happy uh, by escalation against U.S. forces. Would you credit the department and the administration at large pressure uh, or messaging uh, to Iran and Iraqi authorities as uh, maybe uh, uh, a direct result for, for issuing such a statement? Uh, again, look, we've seen that, and I'm just going to stay wh where I was earlier. Actions speak louder than words. So, okay. Oren. Uh, I just want to be clear on a point. Part of your answer to Missy and part of your answer to Eric. You said to Missy, we will take steps to make sure our forces are protected, and you said if we have something to announce, we will announce it, but I want to ask specifically, you, you are adding air defense or force protection measures. You make it sound like there, there will be changes coming. And I just want to I, be clear I'm saying that. that we will take necessary step, steps to ensure that our forces are protected. I don't have any specifics to announce right now. But above and beyond the measures that are currently in place. We're, we're always assessing uh, force protection. Uh, and so, you know, I'll just leave it broad like that especially, again, in light of, uh, you know, recent events. Constantine. Uh, thanks, Pat. Um, uh, the forces at Tower 22, are they receiving hazardous duty incentive pay? I'll have to take that question. My assumption is yes, but I'll have to take that question. And then um, I, my other question would be, are they eligible for combat action ribbons? Again, I'll have to take that one. Thank you. Nancy. Um, Yesterday, um, Sabrina said that the secretary is going for a follow-up appointment. Can you tell us what the status of that is and if um, that means any changes to his health? Yeah. Um, so he went to the appointment last night, uh, left the doctor's office. Uh, as I understand it, this is part of his uh, planned physical therapy. So still recovering well, still healthy, uh, still in the building. And then you mentioned that he was going to the Dignified Transfer on Friday. Will that be open? Any part of that be open? Uh, so you can contact uh, the Air Force Mortuary Operations. Uh, they manage press access to the dignified transfer. To my knowledge, those are, again, uh, up to the families whether it's open or not, but um, certainly you can put that request in with them. Okay. And um, one other thing, I didn't understand yesterday there was some issue around filming um, part of the arrival of S Secretary Stoltenberg. Can you help me understand what the challenges were in terms of filming his actual arrival? What, why the uh, I'm not tracking any specific challenges, so. Well, there, th we weren't allowed, as I understand it, to film the walk up, but only at the um, upstairs. I'm just trying to understand if that's a. We followed normal protocol for a visit, as I understand it, by the NATO Secretary General. So typically, does not because it's not a country, it's not uh, afforded honors per se. So it was the standard arrival. The secretary arrived in the building per standard procedure and process. And uh, the pool, because of the size of the room, was invited uh, to come in and cover the top of that meeting. Right. I'm just trying to understand, were they allowed to film the the outside part, the arrival part? My understanding is they weren't. I, I don't know that they were not. I'm not tracking anybody saying that they couldn't. We've just followed normal procedure for any type of uh, DV visit to the Pentagon. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, sir. 
Thank you. I have a couple on Ukraine then on Middle East. So do you have any updates on weapons deliveries to Ukraine under USCI? Uh, are <coughs> some of the capabilities currently being delivered to Ukraine despite no PDA announcements? Um, no, no new PDA announcements. Of course, we're we're still uh, standing by on, on a supplemental from from Congress. But U USAI deliveries that was they were procured before that. Uh, I I don't have anything specific to announce right now. Of course, we're going to continue to work with Ukraine to deliver those capabilities uh, as they come online. Also, could you tell us more about the ongoing Inspector General's visit to Ukraine? What? They will be looking into. Will they go to the front lines? Things yeah, like I'd that. Yeah, I'd have to refer you to the inspector general's office. Let me go back to the phone here. Uh, Jeff Shogel, task and purpose. Thank you. Um, the National Defense Authorization Act includes a lot of funding to replenish the Defense Department stockpiles of munitions, like artillery shells and SM6 missiles. But there can't be any new starts until Congress passes a spending bill. So. Does the fact that uh, the Defense Department is still on a continuing resolution mean that it hasn't been able to replenish or any of its stocks of uh, shells and missiles or, or at least get started on new contracts? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. You're, you're uh, talking about in terms of Ukraine or just in general? For, the, for the, the, each of the services uh, has funding for shells, missiles, to, uh, especially considering that so many has been given to Ukraine. This is the, the ammunition buildup for the U.S. military. Yeah, so I'd, I'd refer you to each of the services to talk about their current status. But as you highlight, during a continuing resolution, uh, we are limited uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in, in many ways, in terms of being able to uh, extend contracts. Uh, it disrupts training, uh, it delays maintenance, it imposes uncertainty on the workforce. So uh, again, each of the services can talk about their individual impacts. Uh, let me go to Phil Stewart, Reuters. Oh, hey there, thanks. At the White House today, uh, there was uh, some talk that there would be a, a tiered response to the drone strike in, in Jordan. Uh, and that could be multiple actions instead of a single action. Could you just confirm that, that you're expecting a tiered response with multiple actions? And then secondly, on the on the uh, KH statement, I mean, could could you offer a little more? I mean, what do you mean by actions speak louder than words? Are you, are you, you would you like to see them make good on this this uh, promise to suspend uh, operations on U.S. forces? Could you just elaborate what you meant by that? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, on your on your first question, uh, again, we're we're not going to telegraph or discuss details associated with any future operations. Um, and again, on on uh, the the statement that's out there. You know, I, I don't think we could be any more clear uh, that we have called on the Iranian proxy groups to stop their attacks. Uh, they have not. Uh, and so uh, we will respond in a time and manner of our choosing. Uh, when I say actions speak louder than words, um, you know, there has been three attacks, to my knowledge, uh, since the 28th of January. Uh, and I'll just leave it there. Okay. Got time for just a few more here. Let's go to Howard Altman, Warzone. Thanks, Pat. Uh, a couple questions. One, um, do you, have you? Um, can you confirm the political reporting that the uh, ground launch small diameter bomb could be delivered to Ukraine as, as soon as tomorrow? And then, has the Pentagon been informed by Ukraine of any change at the top of its uh, command? There's been a lot of discussion about. General's illusion being replaced. Has, has Ukraine said anything definitive to the Pentagon? Yeah, thanks, Howard. Uh, on, on your latter question there, I'm not tracking any changes. Obviously, it's it's for Ukraine to discuss their uh, internal uh, domestic affairs. Um, as far as the um, small diameter bomb, as we acknowledged last year, uh, we will provide Ukraine with the ground launch small diameter bomb uh, as part of our USI a, or USAI funded security assistance efforts. Um, however, due to operation security reasons, we're not going to confirm specific timelines. We'll defer to Ukraine to talk about any delivery. Uh, but we do, as I mentioned, continue to work closely with Ukraine, with our industry partners to ensure that Ukraine receives and is ready to use the capabilities uh, that we're delivering to them and as quickly as possible. Thanks. So recognizing there's an ongoing <coughs> investigation into it, is there any indication at this point with the drone attack 
that this was a result of a technology failure or gap or versus human error in terms of <coughs> recognizing what the technology and information was saying. Yeah. Again, I, I appreciate the question. Um, CENTCOM is looking into all of that. The other aspect of this, uh, which, which I know you all appreciate, uh, is the operations force protection aspect in terms of, um, you know, vulnerabilities. It's not something we would uh, talk about, certainly from the podium here. All that to say, uh, we do recognize and, and appreciate the interest, and I, I can tell you that CENTCOM is looking into all of that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you have any concern that while you are responding to this attack, any party, whether it's ally or adversary, would exploit this situation to their benefit? And did you convey any message to that effect? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand uh, what, what you're asking. I mean, um, do you have any concern? while you are responding to that attack, to this attack on the American, troop, on American troops in Jordan, that any party, whether it's a lie or a lie, would exploit this situation to their own benefit. You've been saying you don't want to widen this war. And did you convey any message to any party, speaking here specifically yeah. about Lebanon? Uh, again, um, you know, we are not, First of all, taking a step back, looking at the broader region, we fully recognize the tensions right now that are in the Middle East. From the very beginning of the Israel-Hamas conflict, we've been very clear that we're going to work very hard with our allies and our partners in the region to prevent a broader conflict. When it comes to the situation in Iraq and Syria and Jordan, uh, our troops were attacked and three U.S. service members were killed and over 40 wounded. Um, the president and the secretary have both said that we will respond in a time and place of our choosing. Uh, I'm, again, not going to go into details of, of what that could look like, other than the fact that there will be consequences. And, and I'm just going to, again, leave it right there. Nancy, last question. Um, you mentioned earlier that CENCOM is investigating. Can you tell us who is investigating? Is there one person? Can you give us some? So we've heard several references to the yeah, investigation. So, uh, you know, I, term of art here, I, I would not use the word investigation. They're uh, reviewing it. Um, of course, investigation uh, has a specific, uh, you know, connotation. Obviously, it's up to CENTCOM whether or not uh, they open a formal investigation. Typically, after any type of incident, there is always some type of review or investigation. But my point is, uh, you know, U.S. Central Command uh, and leaders within the command are, are looking at this. I don't have a specific name to pass along to you, but I can tell you it's, we're taking it very seriously. Right, but we heard the term yesterday. So what you're telling us is there's not one person who's looking into this? Is there some sort of like, I don't know, um, there's no like 15, six, there's no kind of... I'll have to get back to you on that, Nancy. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.